child, I always had this image in my head. I always wanted to go off into Africa, work in a refugee camp, you know, like in the movies, the one with Angelina Jolie and Clive Owen, you know, <laughs> really cool. So I finished school and I decided to study medicine. For six years, I tried to cram as much information as I possibly could into my head. To be honest, after the exams, I forgot most of them. <laughs> Luckily, after six years, I passed, much to the surprise of my uh, parents and siblings. And I started working as a doctor. And I thought, okay, after a couple of years, I said, actually, let me go try this international humanitarian organization thing. Let me go out. But it's actually quite difficult. You know, you have to apply, you have to go through a series of interviews. The first interview, they kind of check if you're a psychopath. You know, the second interview, they check if you're a sociopath. <laughs> you know, and then the third interview, very important, they make sure that you're not a homeopath. <laughs> Sorry to all the homeopathics out there. <laughs> so then, at the last kind of final thing, they kind of say, you know, well done, Mohammed, sit down. Uh, you've passed all the tests. We can now send you out. We can send you onto a mission. I'm like all excited. I'm like, okay, cool. So then they asked me, so where would you like to go? And you know, I, I was born in South Africa. I was raised here. I have this great affinity for the African continent. So I was like, you know, I want to go somewhere in Africa. And the recruiter stops. She looks at me. She looks at me up and down. She goes, Mohammed. You know, I think, I'm, I'm not sure why, but I just think you do really well in Pakistan. <laughs> so I say, okay, let's, let's try Pakistan. A month later, I find myself in this beautiful mountainous village on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And it's, it's freezing cold. And I'm going to tell you a story now that I don't actually like telling, but I'm going to try to tell anyway. Um, it was a really busy day. I was working as the emergency room doctor and the emergency doctor in charge of the unit. And it was really busy. To be honest, it was chaotic. There was patients everywhere. There were patients on the stretchers. There were two patients on one stretcher. There were patients on chairs. There were patients on the floor. There were people everywhere. And the nurses and the we were trying the best that we could. We were trying to sort out patients, and it's a way of prioritizing patients. So if you're really sick, you're red, you come in, you kind of say, okay, you need to be seen now. If you're not so sick, you have a sore toe, okay, you can wait a little bit. And that process is called triage. It's a simple algorithm with a mathematical score. And it was a chaotic day, and we were doing the best that we could. After about seven hours, seven, eight hours of working flat out, I finally had a breather. I was like, okay. And I went to kind of go check around and make sure that we didn't miss anybody in the ward. And in one of the side wards, there was a small room with about five stretches on. And there was about 15 people in the room. And I found a young woman, 22 years old. And I will never forget her face. She had these piercing eyes. She had a light blue blue traditional dress on. And I still remember she had her sandals on her feet while she was lying there. And she had been waiting for eight hours, waiting for care. She had been waiting for eight hours, and in all that time she had been bleeding internally. I went to go examine her. I immediately saw that this was a critically ill patient. So I rushed her through to the emergency room. And the team, we did everything. We put up IV lines, we put up fluids, we put up blood, we put up oxygen. We tried everything that we possibly could. And I tried to do everything that I knew how to do. And despite all my efforts, despite everything that we tried, I lost her. She died. And I was kind of helpless. I felt, I felt helpless. I felt scared. And I felt angry. 
I felt angry because she died from a completely treatable condition. She suffered from something called an ectopic pregnancy, a pregnancy outside of the uterus. And if picked up early, can be treated very effectively with a simple operation. An operation that could save a life. And I was angry because we made a mistake. We made a mistake because we were human. We made a mistake and our mistake cost someone their life. And I was angry because we live in the 21st century. We live in a world where in certain countries we can make cars drive themselves. Surely this we could fix. Surely this we could make better. And I was angry because I failed my patient. We failed her. So I started internalizing, I started thinking, okay, what was the problem? What was the issue? You know, what, what, what was going on? Is it, is it technology? Technology is the problem. That's the issue. You know, we don't have technology in the developing world. But that's not really true. So in the developing world, there are more mobile phones than there are people who have access to clean drinking water. More mobile phones than access to clean drinking water. So it's not mobile technology then. It's not technology. So we said, okay, maybe it's money, because money is always the issue. Again, maybe not so much. The GSMA, which is this global cellular organization, has forecast that in 2015, the e-health industry is going to be worth something like 160 billion US dollars. So there's enough money. So he said, okay, you know what? It's regional. Definitely it's regional, because these things only happen in a far, far away place. That's why it happened, because it's far, far away. And sadly, that's not the truth either. In the Western Cape, in 2013, 100,000 patients were incorrectly triaged. 100,000 people. I'm not sure if any of them died. So we started thinking, and I came back home, and I got together with a couple of friends, and we decided, okay, we have to do something about this. I mean, this is what we have to change. This is what we need to do as a side project. This is what we need to have. And we said, okay, a couple of things have been running throughout the day. And it's about collaboration. And that's where we thought, okay, we have to collaborate. That's the first point. We have to be open, collaborative. That's what we're going to do. And then we said, okay, and we have to be innovative because that's the buzzword. You know, you have to be innovative. There's some innovation, something. You have to do something cool. <laughs> and then we said, okay, we have to use a tool that is already out there. We have to use tools that are already available to people. And that's where technology kind of comes in. Okay, so we're going to use technology. So we said, okay, cool, we got those three tenants, we got the process, we're going to go, okay, boom. So then we started on this journey. And we started collaborating with academics, so experts in triage from the South African Triage Group, from the, the African Federation of Emergency Medicine. We started talking to nurses that had 20 years experience in triage. We started talking to nurses that had two years experience in triage. We started talking to nurses that had no experience in triage. And it's understanding and sharing these ideas because I believe that as human beings, we flourish and we can overcome immense obstacles if we start sharing ideas, if we start collaborating with each other. So then we started getting designers involved and developers and we started putting them all together in the same room and letting them share ideas, letting them collaborate with each other. Okay, so we get some great ideas coming up. And I was thinking, okay, so I have to be doing something innovative here, because this is not really innovative, it's just collaboration. So we said, okay, cool. We have to make something really cool, complex, you know, glasses with stuff on the side here that you can, you know, do stuff with. <laughs> but one of the simple things that we learned was that maybe the most innovative things that you have to do is keep it simple. Sometimes the most simple things in life make the biggest impact. Something as simple as an egg cup could save lives. Something as simple as an application 
that just stepwise goes through the algorithm for a nurse could save someone's life. So maybe the innovation, the innovative approach is a simplistic one. So we said, okay, fine. So what are we going to use? Okay, we're going to use technology. Technology in the developing world. We're going to use mobile phones. We're going to use tablets. We're going to use iP okay, maybe not iPad in the developing world so much, but we're going to use mobile phones. So we said, okay, cool. And out of this process, out of this journey, a triage application was born. An application that is simple. And people often look at it and go, that's it? Doesn't it do anything else? <laughs> but it doesn't have to. And all it does is it goes through a set of questions and it guides the nurse. It computes the mathematical score. So when we are overstretched, when our resources are limited, when we are tired, it doesn't make mistakes. It guides us and capacitates the nurses because it will help them and help them remember ad additional tasks that they have to do. And then we also realized that we had to get it out there. So we made it freely available. We opened access. And in the last six months, it's been downloaded in 43 different countries all around the world. It's been used by hundreds of healthcare workers in the developing world. It's been used by the NSRI, the National Sea Rescue Institute of South Africa. It's been used by nursing colleges in South Africa as a way of training their nurses, as a stepwise approach through the algorithm. It's been implemented in the one of the largest emergency centers in the Western Cape, Kailicha Hospital, where independently the emergency medicine doctors have proven that it has increased accuracy of triage and has decreased waiting times. Now, it's about the tenets of collaboration, of innovation, simplistic may it be, and technology that we can use the same kind of process for other gaps in healthcare, for other areas that we need to approach and for other areas that we need to fix. So I ask you this, I ask you, if we could achieve all of this in triage, just a triage, a small facet of healthcare, just by collaboration, just by talking to each other and sharing ideas. What could we achieve in this audience if we had all the designers, the developers, the healthcare workers speaking to each other, sharing ideas, coming up with solutions that are made by us for us? Maybe we could capacitate healthcare workers. Maybe we could improve patient care. And maybe, just maybe, we wouldn't fail our patients. We wouldn't have to fail people. Because that's the 21st century I want to live in. That's the world that I want to live in. And I'm damn sure that's the world that you want to live in as well. Thank you. <laughs>